In response to World War II and the need to develop a capability to mass produce these new uh, synthetic polymer materials, uh, a lot of developments in the 40s, 50s, and 60s focused on uh, refinements uh, to the ability to produce materials in a controlled manner. Uh, and one of the needs uh, in order to do that is to be able to characterize or determine the properties of the materials that are being produced. And we talked before, if you remember in the first lecture, that the chain length uh, is one of the main properties that is of interest uh, to uh, characterize polymers. And we use the term molecular weight to, to discuss that, and we'll talk about that in more detail shortly. Uh, but techniques to characterize molecular weight or to measure molecular weight were developed in the 1940s uh, and 1950s. Also, refinements in terms of the chemistry, so not necessarily discovering new materials, but discovering new processes to produce them with a greater capability to control the chain architecture. And we'll talk about this a little bit when we discuss polyethylene, but catalysts, uh, chemistry systems that allow the reaction to take place and produce polymers that have a controlled molecular weight or that control side reactions so that uh, the product is more consistent. Uh, these are all uh, important things that need to be done, and they need to be done at a massive scale if uh, you're going to produce uh, you know, a large quantity of these kinds of materials. Block copolymers uh, was another innovation. So this is the idea that uh, instead of having one kind of monomer unit that's repeated uh, along the polymer chain, uh, you could have two or more different kinds of monomers that are uh, repeated along the chain in different orders, uh, and those monomers could have different properties. So, for example, one monomer could be hydrophobic or uh, water-hating, uh, uh, and the other one could be hydrophilic or water-loving. Uh, so then if you put this material uh, into an aqueous uh, solution, then it's going to fold up uh, in a shape where uh, the um, hydrophobic elements minimize their uh, contact with the surrounding water and the hydrophilic elements maximize their contacts. So by manipulating these behaviors, uh, people can design materials with specialized properties because you can control the shape or the structure uh, that these polymer chains will uh, fold into. An important discovery uh, in the 1960s that I want to highlight uh, is uh, the discovery of a material called Kevlar. Uh, so this was also discovered at DuPont uh, by a chemist named Stephanie Kwolek. Uh, so this was a material that was kind of not necessarily an accidental discovery, but let's say an unintentional discovery. Uh, you know, Stephanie Kwolek and her team were doing research to develop new materials, uh, you know, to continue to um, uh, satisfy the needs of, uh, of this growing market. Uh, and uh, one day in a series of experiments, uh, she noticed that a material that she produced had a very strange property that is if you concentrate at things more and more, typically they'll become thicker or more viscous because you're adding more and more material. But in this case, this material, as if the concentration was increased more and more, it reached a point where actually it became thinner uh, and less viscous. And so this was a very strange uh, property. It was later um, shown that this is what's called a, a liquid crystalline uh, state. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But what gives rise to that behavior was the fact that these polymers were not flexible materials, uh, flexible chains, but actually very rigid chains, like rods, rigid rods. And this rigid rod characteristic uh, actually gives this material some very special properties. So these rigid units can be spun into fibers uh, where these molecules have a very... Uh, uniform orientation in the spinning direction and that architecture gives them a very high strength uh, in the in the in tension uh, even stronger than steel uh, and so these properties became very useful for uh, producing high strength low weight materials uh, so Kevlar uh, fibers are used to produce bulletproof vests and body armor uh, and also uh, a lot of specialty materials like sports equipment uh, and things like, um, you know, pressure vessels. So uh, these fibers can be spun uh, into canisters or uh, tanks uh, that uh, are very lightweight. So, for example, climbers, uh, when they go to Mount Everest or uh, those kind of things, uh, usually their oxygen bottles uh, are made from spun Kevlar fiber because they're much lighter uh, 
than the equivalent uh, metal uh, canisters that they would have to carry otherwise. Uh, so this material uh, had a huge impact uh, on, uh, on the industry by uh, sort of carving out new applications that people hadn't thought of before. Uh, I like this picture, actually, of uh, Stephanie Kwolak. These are sort of in the later years. But if you remember uh, from the um, previous video uh, where we talked about Wallace Carruthers, uh, and I showed a photo of him uh, as part of his description, uh, this photo actually is the same one that's uh, behind her here uh, at uh, probably her office uh, in DuPont. Okay, so as we moved into the 1970s, uh, the technology to mass produce uh, polymers and products that were made from polymers really increased. Uh, and so it was during this time that uh, polymers or plastics actually surpassed steel uh, as the most widely used material per unit volume. And I say per unit volume because uh, obviously they're lighter than steel, so per unit weight, uh, it wouldn't be a fair comparison, but uh, they really became widely. If you think about, you know, before that time, uh, there were no plastic uh, beverage containers, beverage bottles. They were just all tin or aluminum cans uh, for soft drinks and uh, things like that. Uh, now uh, those uh, are largely uh, surpassed, uh, surplanted by uh, plastic bottles. Uh, so this transition uh, began to happen uh, during the 1970s. And that takes us kind of up to the present time, uh, sort of the frontier areas. Again, people are interested in manipulating at finer and finer levels of detail, the properties of these materials. So not just the mechanical or chemical properties, but also electronic properties uh, to make semiconductors. For example, people want to make flexible displays for phones and computers that you can roll up or fold up. Uh, and so many of those uh, rely on polymers that have uh, semiconducting properties. Biopolymers, there's a lot of interest in producing materials that uh, have compatibility with the body or mimic uh, the properties of uh, different materials like bone uh, or skin uh, or other implantable materials. So contact lenses, for example, uh, are an example of a material called a hydrogel, where it's a very loosely cross-linked polymer that's hydrophilic. So water uh, inside uh, is uh, held inside the hydrogel and helps it maintain its, uh, its structure. Uh, nanoscale properties, again, taking the idea of block copolymers uh, to a very small uh, level and controlling in, in very fine detail uh, how these materials uh, organize and assemble to control their properties. And finally, uh, what's in the news today is this issue of uh, plastic waste. So uh, some of the main properties that make polymers so useful, their durability, uh, their strength, uh, their ability to be mass produced, uh, these have really led to such widespread use of polymers, but they're also now uh, kind of detrimental properties in the sense that uh, they don't really break down very easily when they're disposed of. Uh, so it's so cheap and, uh, and easy to make disposable products and packaging uh, that then gets thrown away. And so now these uh, waste materials are starting to accumulate. Uh, and so people are interested in coming up with ways to uh, degrade or break down uh, these, um, uh, these, uh, these materials or, or allow them to be reused uh, and recycled. Uh, and so I think if you look in the news today, you're going to see a lot of uh, things on that. Okay, so those are kind of the highlights uh, of the history, the evolution of the field of polymer science and polymer engineering. Uh, I hope you can get a sense for how impactful uh, synthetic polymers are, uh, because again, uh, it's really hard to think about what life was like uh, before these materials existed. And it really wasn't that long ago uh, when, uh, when we didn't have access uh, to these kinds of materials. So now with that background, we can go back and take a closer look at some specific kinds of polymers and see how their molecular scale structure affects their bulk properties.